Hello, I'm Ben Wattenberg. It's said by some that we are entering a global golden age for business. Is that so? How are American companies doing? What can they do better? This week on Think Tank, we take a trip to the Harvard Business School to help us make tracks to the future. Joining us to look at the nuts and bolts of American business are Bruce Scott, the Paul W. Charrington Professor of Business Administration and the co-author of U.S. Competitiveness in the World Economy. Nancy Kane, Assistant Professor at the Harvard Business School and author of The Power of Commerce, Economy and Governance in the First British Empire. Kent Bowen, the William Barclay Harding Professor in Business Administration and author of The Perpetual Enterprise Machine, Seven Keys to Corporate Renewal Through Successful Product and Process Development. The topic before the house, how American companies take on the world. This week on Think Tank. The stock market is volatile. Booms and busts are part of the game, but most analysts agree America's economy remains strong. Some say that America may be entering a new golden age. It's a big topic worth two think tank programs. For a look at the big picture, we begin with business historian Professor Nancy Kane. Uh, you are a business historian. You are writing a book, I understand, about the three industrial revolutions. What are they? There's an obvious question <laughs> to start about, to start with. Well, um, they are moments, I'd say succinctly, of overarching, defining economic change. The change is not necessarily confined to economics, but it's mostly, if history serves us well, driven by, by economic change, often with technological drivers, technological causes. Okay, what's number one? First one, Britain, 1760 to 1820, Manchester, the West Riding of Yorkshire, Northwest England, the Silicon Valley of the 18th century were spinning textiles, mostly cotton, some metalware industry and manufacturing, which seems primitive by our standards, but would have been a quantum leap in productivity and in income in the possibility of profits by the standards of the time. So the first one is Britain, late 18th century. Is that driven by the steam engine? Steam engine is important, but it doesn't really become, it's not, it's not the critical driver. The critical driver are things that seem so, so antiquated, seem quaint by our standards. The spinning jenny, Arkwright's water frame to weave more efficiently. The steam engine is important, but it, it, isn't, the, it isn't the thing that gets the revolution started. I mean, there are a whole host of interrelated factors, but the technology, again, by our standards is primitive, and it's concerned primarily around spinning and weaving textiles. And, and to a certain extent around metalworking processes. Okay, what's phase two? Second Industrial Revolution, less well known to, to students of uh, elementary and high school history, is, is the period of time centered in the United States between roughly 1870 and 1920. This is called the Second Industrial Revolution. It's, again, got technological drivers that are critical, the railroad and the telegraph which link people and places and goods and businesses in new ways um, and which create a national market for the first time. Because until you can move carpets and cows and iron bars around, you can't really have a national steel industry. And that, of course, requires some other technological and that, that, innovations. that drives national advertising. And that drives national biscuit company. You need a biscuit, Nabisco. That uh -huh. drives national advertising. The first issue of Printer's Inc. Is, is the middle of the 1880s. And it's growing up in tandem with the rise of big business. Printer's Inc. being the trade magazine, magazine of, for the advertising for the, trade. Or the early trade magazine for the advertising industry. Mm -hmm. So this is the birth of Coca-Cola, of Sears Roebuck, of Montgomery Wards, of all the department stores. Of catalog sales. Of catalog sales, because you need a railroad before right. you can have the 19th century counterpart of electronic commerce. Mm -hmm. um, uh, this is the birth of U.S. Steel, which is, grows out of Carnegie Steel. This is the birth of General Electric. 247 of last year's Fortune 500 companies are founded between 1880 and 1920. 
247. So if we think a quarter is a long time, it's, it's, you know, in the, in the half-life of capitalism, imagine what that says about the window of opportunity at these moments of change. But, but what is the, the third exclamation point? Uh, I, well, I, I'm, I call it the third industrial revolution. Right. That's a historical bias. We could call it the information revolution. We could call it the communications revolution. We could call it the computer revolution. And we were doing that two years ago before the internet was on everyone's right. lips. Right. But, but it begins somewhere, I think, around 1970. I, I've chosen 1970 because it seems to me a moment when a variety of stabilizing buttresses in global capitalism seem to give way. Um, the American, American dominance, which has persisted in the global economy since 1945, is no longer a sort of postulate or first principle. Uh, the, the power of the tech, information technology is, is understood in, in terms of the mainframe. IBM comes out with its sort of paradigm-shifting System 360 in 1963, makes its first investments in that. And that's just beginning to be felt. By the mid-70s, it will be something called the Homebrew Computer Club, meeting in a classroom at Stanford University, full of a bunch of hobbyists saying there's something really neat going on in a personal computer. Apple will be found in that, de in that decade. Microsoft will be founded in 1978. I like to date it about 1970 because a bunch of different drivers seem to come together. There seems to be a concatenation of stuff happening that's interesting. Let me, let me, let me suggest uh, something else. If, if this uh, revolution began in 1970, give or take a few years, um, if, if we had been sitting, and it's still going on, part and parcel of the same deal, if we had been sitting here in 1970 and I told you, Nancy, we are going to be in, within a, a decade or so, uh, in for an era of global peace where democracy is riding the crest of the wave, where international trade is going to increase beyond our belief, where markets are going to be uh, worshipped by all, including the communists in China, uh, and the fifth aspect would be technology, and we would, we would agree that, yeah, okay. Now, all those things happened, and not a whole lot of people were predicting them. No, no, now, no. now uh, isn't it fair, to, is, is it plausible then to say that we are, the 1990s are the third and a half, half, uh, third and a half industrial revolution? I mean, isn't there a break in there somewhere around the mid-80s or, or so where suddenly all of these vast structural changes have, have come about? You're absolutely right. It's much more than just technology. I mean, the, the, and the examples you gave are perfect examples of that. You know, globalization, this you know, buzzword of the, along with empowerment, one of the, you know, the, the words of the 90s, is, is, is linked to this technology. I mean, it, it's, it, it's a lot easier for IBM to do business in China if they can connect to, to, to managers and markets and resource input supplies via the internet than it is if they don't have that kind of technology. But, but there's much more going on, right? There's this huge political issue, the, the, the five or six round bout between state planned economies and capitalism that, that really ended in the late 80s, right? And capitalism won. Adam Smith, you know, can roll over and rest easy in his grave. Um, and and that's, 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 a, that's a political issue as much as it's a technological issue. Just as the rise of organized labor, antitrust legislation, um, labor, labor legislation that came out of that, the rise of the Federal Reserve System, those were political issues that came with the second industrial revolution. Till you have a factory, till you have mass numbers of people working in a factory, you don't really have organized labor. So, so I think it's chapter two and it's being, or chapter three, and as you said, being driven by much more than technology, politics, social issues, uh, the power of communication to make one person or one brand a global brand very quickly, so that Michael Jordan is known around the world as is Madonna. All those, all those threads are interrelated in this very rich quilt. So something big seems to be going on, big and global. Now, each nation tackles commerce differently. America, for example, prefers a hands-off, free market approach. But is that necessarily the best way? Can America compete with companies that are backed by government dollars? We contrast and compare national economic strategies with Professor Bruce Scott. But let's sort of 
go through this this modern world and, and uh, look at the various sorts of national models uh, that are in the game. Uh, maybe you can describe who who is pursuing what sort of strategies. Okay. Uh, Start with the United States. Sure, but put the U.S. and Britain in the same. This, okay. this is the Adam Smith model of let's have free markets, uh, let everybody do what they want, uh, minimize the role of government, and assume that uh, the capital formation by market forces will be adequate and that the appropriate role for government is only dealing with marginal failures of people not taking account of pollution or whatever. All right? And uh, we're uh, assuming, in addition, as he did, that that market's going to also give you a reasonable distribution of income. Adam Smith lives. Right. Uh, and that's, and, that's and here, that's here, and that's in Britain. And those are the two lead, and, and in New Zealand. Those would be the lead places of that model. And let's turn everything as much as we can into arm's length commercial relationships. And, and for the moment, at least, on an economic side, they are doing very well. Yes. Okay. Measured by average incomes. Right. Okay. Uh, okay. Second model. Uh, would be one that says, I'm mercantilist, I'm promoting... Yeah, you have to de define um, mercantilist, because um, it's one of those words that everybody uses and... I'm not using it. I'm not few of us under understand it. Yeah, but I'm not just viewing it as individual actions or even firm actions. I've got a deliberate strategy that says I want to promote saving, I want to promote investment, I want to have uh, collective notions of building economic power. And uh, the first one of these is Venice, and it starts out roughly in the year 1100. Uh, it's the originator of capitalism, as people understood it. All the trading in the Venetian system had to come, even from Istanbul, all the way back to Venice so that they could tax the trades. So I'm going to build the ships, I'm going to build the system, I control the trade. The Japanese did almost the same thing after World War II that the Venetians had done 700 years before that. So I'm going to run the thing as a system, and I'm going to do it for the benefit of the collectivity and of the people controlling the collectivity, which was, in their case, the people that lived on the islands in the Adriatic, not for the farmers on the mainland. It was a system dominated by the producer interests of the merchants. The Japanese have done the same thing since uh, World War II. Mm -hmm. okay. okay, that's Model 2. Right. Now, uh, are the Europeans a separate model? Yeah, I, it, it's different enough to say yes. How, how Theirs they? has been so we have capitalists, we have mercantilists, which are some well, of the... Well, let's call them Adam Smith. Okay, we've got Adam, Adam Smith, we got mercantilists, and with the Europeans, you've got some sort of a... I mean, uh, Ludwig Erhard's, you know, we're going to have a social market economy. I mean, it's pretty close to a socialist market economy uh, in this game. And it says, yes, we may have signed up to have free trade, but we're going to protect people's lives, and we're going to protect people's lives in particular in the labor market. All right, so we're going to have legislation that says it's either going to be no layoffs or it's going to be extremely expensive to have layoffs. We're going to have very generous safety nets for people that are out of work. We're going to have very generous disability payment and a very generous system of welfare payments for poor. So it's very expensive, and uh, if you want to say it's very generous. A and it makes it very hard for the employers to hire an extra person because he has this huge o overload of, of benefits he's got to pay with it. Or, or the risk of if you say, gee, I really don't need you, then it's very expensive to lay you off. Well, then the easier way to do it is I'm not going to hire you in the first place. Right, which yeah. is why you have unemployment rates up at 12 and 13 percent around Europe. Let me take a different measure of it. Yeah. If you take the real champions of this, uh, it would be in Sweden. Sweden has fewer jobs in the private sector today than they had in 1950. Right? All the job growth in Sweden has been in the public sector. All of it for 47 years. They, uh, now, that's a stunning achievement. Right? But it also says you take the public sector from having about 12% unemployment to about 12% uh, of your labor force to, I don't know, it's 25%, it's, uh, something like that. Uh, you've created a very, very expensive system that's got to be all tax financed. Right? Uh, it's a system that's unaffordable uh, today, and people are going to have to cut this back. Now, they're, in a way, the caricature. But if you go around in Western Europe, uh, and say it's not just unemployment. Look at where the employment is. Denmark has created no jobs in the private sector since 1960. 
Uh, there's just two of them that I happen to uh, recall in this thing. So it's partly job growth, uh, and we're creating the jobs, and we're creating the jobs in the private sector. Okay. Now, you want to talk about uh, the social consequences of these three models. Yeah, well, I think right. that uh, you're picking up two of the three measures. Number one would be average incomes. Number two would be employment. And I would say number three is the distribution of the income. And uh, our model is, to begin with, uh, of the industrial countries, we start even 1980, by far the most unequal incomes of any of the industrial countries. We're right at the borderline of income distribution like a third world country. And it's becoming more unequal all the time. Let me ask you a question. If, if because um, I'll, I promise, I'll return okay. to inequality. But okay. uh, stipulated that inequality is getting larger. The difference between, the proportionate difference between the rich and the poor right. is growing. Right. But if at the same time, everyone's getting richer. Yeah. That can happen. The, the sure rich happen. are getting richer at a faster rate, but the poor are getting richer at a slower rate, but they are getting richer. Okay. Uh, is, is, is that bad? No, no, no. Uh, I think you'd have... Is it's, it bad? It's, it's kind of what's happening in the United States, near as I can figure it out. Well, I mean, it's I pretty, think pretty tough to figure it out. I must oh, that's right. Uh, if you take it on what wages are for the low end, they're clearly going down. If you take in other things, or you take in, you say, I disagree with the inflation adjustment and so on. The you inflation adjustment, the, 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 those BLS figures that it's based on, uh, the, the principal series didn't, uh, didn't include... Uh, uh, um, health plans and retirement benefits no, and a whole lot talking, of other things. you're talking about non-wage income. Yeah, right. Okay, if right, you're talking about non-wage income, the guy on the bottom is about flat for the last 22 years. Yeah, and if you factor if you take in the wage, CPI at the right way, it's, it's growth, and if you do per capita rather than household or rather than wage earner, it's up. I mean, there's a lot of ways to measure that. Yeah. Right, okay. I mean, per capita income over the last 20, 30 years is up substantially. Yeah, but that, that's right. Average income. But if you're talking about for the bottom 20 percent, uh, you're going to really have to stretch to show that there's any improvement at all. We've laid out these uh, three interesting models. Adam Smith's social democratic mercantilist America is more so than any nation in the world in that global economy. Uh, your CEO of the XYZ Corporation, Professor yeah. Scott, how do you deal around the world, how do you deal with those other economies who will subsidize the Airbus, who will do a lot of, uh, uh, a lot of, uh, who, who will try to keep you out of, uh, who, who will erect high tariff barriers to keep you out of selling your Kodak film in Japan, and so on and so forth. How do you, Mr. CEO, what do you, what do you tell your students? How do you deal with it? Uh, well, just take the Kodak thing. Okay. It isn't a high tariff barrier. It's a, a retail and wholesale distribution system designed to have what we would have called fair trade pricing, and it's been supported by the government. All right? So it's an internal tariff barrier, uh, and it, it says, I'm selling in Japan at roughly twice the world market price. Now, Ben, one of the things that does is <coughs> I can have way too many people in my distribution system. If the Japanese had a distribution system like we have, they'd have about three million people they didn't need. Uh, those are low-skill people. Uh, we would find them, okay, dropping out of the bottom. So would the Brits. So you're going to have to say to yourself, uh, they have privatized responsibility for unemployment. Our businesses, they want to privatize responsibility but, but for everything they, except They that. are preventing Kodak from, That's right. from, from selling film at a price lower than Fuji. Right. Okay. It's, let's, Which it's, is a non-market non Barrier, is that what that's called? No, it's, it's, it's having a fair trade system. Now, we ruled it illegal. Well, f fair trades in court, that's the old right. Field Crawford Act here in the United States, right. something like that, where you right. have to charge certain Right. How, how can a market system work if, 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 if you can't compete on price? Well, uh, it, uh, it can and it does, okay? But the customer pays twice too much. But he doesn't get the, the value of uh, the company, right. companies competing. That's right. But on the other hand, I don't have to deal with the problem of watching an underclass cut loose and the violence and all the rest of it go along with it. And those two are just absolutely one and one related. Manufacturing is one standard of a country's economic strength. Some say it's the critical sector. Manufacturing used to be the pride of American commerce, but in recent decades there have been all those stories of factories moving abroad, of goods being made cheaper or better by other countries. We asked Professor Kent Bowen about it. We hear uh, the stories that 
the American manufacturing sector is in the pits, that jobs are going overseas, that people are, are, are losing their jobs, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Um, true? Well, not exactly. Um, if you would have said those words 10 years ago, they would have been more believable. But in the last decade, there have been dramatic changes with American companies as they've played in this global economy, and especially as they've set up their operations and improved their operations here in the United States. So although there is some downsizing and displacement, restructuring, what I think we would see in sector after sector in American industry is a very healthy and robust set of companies. How, how are we doing as manufacturers? I think there are just splendid examples of uh, companies in the United States that were in some sense basket cases uh, ten, 10 years ago that are now really world class. For example? Um, a, a company like Chrysler has, has really turned around. They have exciting new products and currently their factories are turning in to be uh, um, among the better here in the United States and, and in the world. Uh, the steel industry. We, that, that would be uh, Jeeps and, and uh, the uh, minivan, the minivan. And, and now trucks. Uh -huh. So that's the big turnaround. Ford the the, the minivan Jeep. thing has really swept, swept the world, hasn't it? I mean, it's, uh, it, it's been an incredible phenomenon. I mean, after all, I talk about smaller cars, smaller cars, smaller cars. What, in steps Chrysler and says, no, no, what people really want are bigger vehicles. Yes, yeah. and it was uh, off of research and innovation, uh -huh. so a, new, a totally new concept with a lot of risk, but it, re it required uh, engineering and manufacturing to pull that off. How, how did they turn that around? How did they, how did they make, that, make that happen? Well, the company uh, began to look at itself and look outside uh, of Detroit for role models, and uh, the first thing they solved was their new product development process and change that fundamentally, the, the way it's organized and the way work is done. And then following that, they've invested heavily in improving their manufacturing operations. So new leadership as well as new ideas. What's another example of American success stories in manufacturing? Well, a decade ago, uh, there were predictions that the semiconductor industry was on its way out of business because uh, the Japanese were doing so well and the Koreans were coming on strongly. But now there are a number of U.S. Uh, semiconductor manufacturers who are, are leading the pack. Of course, uh, Intel is obvious, but a decade ago or 15 years ago, people were again predicting that Intel might go out of business. But now no one can, can imagine anybody cap, uh, catching up with them. Uh, and and uh, who beside, uh, beside Intel? In addition to Intel, there's Motorola and Texas Instrument that are doing extremely well as they focus on semiconductor production and their factories, whether the factories are here in the United States or factories that they've set up elsewhere in the world, are among the finest in the world in their productivity and quality and along other dimensions. Now, sh should Americans be concerned when a factory or an industry, say clothing, goes overseas? Um, First order, yes, but then they have to understand uh, what's replacing that. And as long as uh, corporations, whether they're U.S. corporations or other uh, international corporations, build factories here, then perhaps there's an, a net gain for us. And this right now, this nation, the United States, is the place to build factories right now. Uh, not for high labor content. But we see BMW building here, Toyota building here. America has a, a huge market and a good workforce. And it's less expensive to do many of these high technology products here than it is in Europe or Japan. So far, not bad. But what should American companies do at home to make themselves better? To find out the latest thinking about labor, leadership, and entrepreneurialism, Join us for part two of your pocket MBA from the Harvard Business School. For Think Tank, I'm Ben Wattenberg. We at Think Tank depend on your views to make our show better. Please send your questions and comments to New River Media, 1150 17th Street Northwest, Washington, D.C., 20036. 
or email us at thinktank at pbs.org. To learn more about Think Tank, visit PBS online at www.pbs.org. And please let us know where you watch Think Tank. This has been a production of BJW Incorporated in association with New River Media, which are solely responsible for its content.